Hey guys, we want to invite you out to our men's night on Friday, March 10th. We're going to fellowship, eat good food, and hear a teaching that will strengthen your faith from our guest speaker, Sean Hershey. This is going to be a great night spent with great people. Invite your friends to come with you. Sign up today at newbeginningsnj.org forward slash brotherhood. If you're 60 or better, we want to invite you out to our senior luncheon on Friday, March 3rd. This is a great time to spend with friends and enjoy a delicious lunch. Invite someone to come with you. We are so excited for our guest speaker, Bill Weiss, to join us in March. In 1998, Bill Weiss had a vision where the Lord chose to take him to hell so he could experience the reality of hell and share his vision with the world. In 2005, Bill wrote a book outlining his vision titled 23 Minutes in Hell. The book became a New York Times bestseller and has been published in 15 languages. That weekend, we are not having services at Bayville or Wall Campus. We're holding all of our services at Brick Campus on March 23rd, 24th, and 25th. We're also doing registration so we can make sure everyone gets a seat. Registration opens Saturday, March 11th. Back my turn. What are you doing? On the dice. It doesn't look like it. You're just playing with them. They gotta feel right. No, it doesn't, you don't have to feel anything. It's too. Just go. Can you just throw them, please? We all have things that. I dropped one. I gotta start again. Yeah, apparently. We've only been sitting here all night playing the game. Can you just throw them? Keep, throw them. Throw them. Get rid of them. Throw them. Toss. Cast. Now. Go. 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 Are you serious? Now we have to pick up all these pieces. Oh yeah, nice. retirement, baby. Nice, congrats. Load me up. I will, but first, I'm gonna tax your pension, and your 401k, and your social security, and your house. You just brought three kids with you. One was his friend. Mm, I'm not done yet. That leaves you, owe me $4,000. So all I have to do is play another red card? That's how this works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. all right. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You guys are skipping me. What's going on? Draw. No, no, you guys, no, I'm think, done. Yeah, I think every time I come here, this is what you guys do every time. I'm done. I'm not playing with you guys anymore. You guys cheat every time. That's enough. Did we go too hard on him? No. It's house rules. Does anyone know where Carmen went? Oh, there he is. Midnight's over! Church. Well, church, let's continue now. You know, we worship God and now opening our hearts to his word, that God's word that he's given to Pastor Joe to speak to us here tonight. Amen. So let's be expectant. Amen. And let's welcome our lead pastor, Joe Soros. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, this country will never be free of sources. Hallelujah. I said two more and we'll change I'll change my name to Jacob. <laughs> Praise God. How are we doing tonight? Good. I'm glad you're all here. Um yeah, I, I got a message to teach this weekend. And um 
I want us to understand that when we study on the topic of sin, we do it in order for us to realize how, damage, how damaging it is and the fact that God loves us so much that he wants us to avoid all the side effects of sin. And most people don't really know what sin is and what it's done to us. We're, we're born into this. We live in a world that is still under the curse of sin. Now, thank God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been redeemed out from under the curse of the law, but the effects of sin are still on this planet. And if we're not aware, sometimes we can allow it to creep back into our lives. And just because we're saved and just because we're born again and our spirits are alive unto God, it doesn't mean that we escape the sowing and reaping process if we allow sin to get back into our lives. Now, the best thing we could do is as soon as we recognize we have sin, as soon as we recognize we've fallen into it, as soon as we recognize that we might start living like somebody who's not righteous, we need to just run to God, not run from him, but to run to him. Amen? Amen. So, see, the average individual, they would look at the serial killer, the rapist, the corrupt politician, and they would say, well, that's sin. But not understanding that if we have a selfish heart, it's the same thing in God's eyes. So we tend to play down our ordinary, everyday sins. But if we would grasp the reality of what sin has done to mankind, maybe we'll do our best to avoid it. Amen? So, God wants sin out of our lives because of its damaging effect. Now, our spirits are saved, right? When you got born again, your spirit is saved. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 14, that by one sacrifice, he perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That process of sanctification is our process of getting more and more away from sin and being formed more and more in the image and likeness of God. Amen? Now, let's clear something up. Because when I said that, I just got to check in my spirit that someone might think, well, you're talking about earning our salvation. No, our salvation is a settled issue. If you are sitting here tonight, and you at some point in your life, whether it was last week or three decades ago, made a declaration of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit's saved. This isn't about salvation. This is about how we live on this planet and what effect sin of this planet could have on our lives. We're tripart beings. You remember that? Amen? We, we are spirit. We possess a soul, and we live in a body. Well, our spirit is, is, is saved. But you have a soul that can be damaged by sin. We have a physical body that can be damaged by the results of sin. Amen? You getting this? I, I want to just qualify that to begin with, because I think I've taught more on this subject since the beginning of the year, percentage-wise, that I have in 25 years of pastoring. It's just we're in that season. God is wanting to separate his church more and more from the things of this world. Now, if you understand the time that we're in, you understand the season that we're in, and you'll know why. We're in a season of preparation. I've been saying this since the beginning of the year. And what are we preparing for? We're preparing for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether you believe when it, whatever your doctrine is that you believe of when it's going to happen, it's not an if, it's a when. That's right. He's coming. Always get a big cheer with that one. He's coming. Amen. So, here's what I want to do tonight. I want to talk about the effects that sin has, has had and can have on our lives I want to talk secondly about what it's going to look like in the future when we are completely 100% restored after Jesus returns. And then I want to talk about the sacrifice that it required was required of Jesus in order to get us to that place. And then we're going to take communion together. Amen? Yes. Sound like a plan? Yes. All right, good. So let's, let's go. Genesis chapter 3. We're going right back to the book of beginnings. Amen? 
Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read all the way down to verse 18. And then we're going to go back over the whole thing again. So let me just read from here so I don't have to follow through on my iPad. So are you, are you all following me here? Yes. Okay, if you have a Bible, please open it up so you can see it. I would like you, if you have a Bible app on your phone, to follow it on your phone. I want you to see for yourself what the scriptures say. So when the woman saw, it's talking about Eve, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Next verse. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Next verse. Then the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, and we'll talk about that, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Next verse. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast in the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, he, the one who would come from the woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Next verse. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And finally, verse 18 both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. I want you to understand, everything from verse 18 all the way back up is a result of sin. It's a side effect of sin. Are you listening? Yes. Now, I want you to see something here. I want you to get this picture. Just a few weeks ago, the nation of Turkey and northern Syria suffered a 7.4 earthquake. That was the initial event. But for days, they suffered aftershocks that further damage, and further the damage that was caused by initial event, by that first event. The first event was a 7.4 earthquake. That hit, and hit with great force. But it didn't stop there. There were aftershocks. And even just up until a few days ago, buildings are still collapsing. The death toll is probably over 30,000 at this point. Now, the same thing happened with Adam and Eve. When they allowed sin to come into the, the human experience, that was the major event. That was the punch. That was the kick. But we've been living with the aftershocks ever since in each and every one of our lives. So let's talk about the aftershocks of sin. We're going to go back into Genesis chapter 3. Number one, it tells us the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. So man went from totally being God conscious, wrapped up in his presence, being totally, to being totally self-conscious and wrapped up in self. Before sin came into the world, before sin came into the human experience, they had no concept, they had no awareness of their condition. They were completely wrapped up in the presence of God, completely satisfied with the presence of God. And so what's happened to us? 
Selfishness and self-centeredness has destroyed our relationship with God and with others. A relationship that could be a loving relationship can become hell on earth when people become selfish, when they become self-absorbed, when it's all about me. And so you'll hear people say stuff like this. Well, you know, I have needs, and they're not meeting my needs. Do we, do we hear ourselves when we say stuff like that? Of course, nobody in here would be that cruel and that uh, cold-hearted. I have needs. And the other person doesn't have needs. But that's what sin did to us. And if we're not careful, that stuff could stay in our lives even after we're born again. Because it's a soul issue. Self-centeredness is a soul issue. Selfishness, selfishness is a soul issue. Are you listening to me? Number two, they sowed fig leaves. Man went from being covered by the glory of God and the presence of God to trying to establish their own righteousness, their own way of covering their flaws, which according to the word is filthy rags. Self-righteousness stinks in God's sight because the only righteousness that you and I are supposed to wear is his righteousness. So we can be born again. And if we're not careful, we can still let selfishness come back into our hearts. We can be born again, completely aware of the presence of God. If we're not careful, if we're not aware, if we're not spending time in the Word, because the Word shows us who we're supposed to be, we can allow not only selfishness, but we will try to establish our own sense of right with God being right with God. Only the blood of Jesus can cover this. I had this, and usually it happens with people. I've had this happen, and it always happens with a person who's in deception. A person could be born again, the Holy Spirit living inside them, slip, get drawn into, get lured into some type of sin, and usually in this case, it's more of a sexual, sexual immorality. And it's so deceived that they'll say, I've had this happen to me in counseling sessions. But you don't understand, Pastor. Uh, everything's good between me and God. <coughs> what are you out of your mind? <laughs> How could you say everything's good between you and God when, you, when you're knowingly walking in an area that's acting just like a person who's never been born again? Acting like a person who's never received righteousness. And we fool ourselves. And, and I hope you're quiet here tonight because you're considering all this and you're allowing it to settle in. Okay? Because, listen to me. I believe the message from the Holy Spirit is this. Get all the junk out of your life. Because the Spirit of God wants to be poured out on this earth like, like, like make the day of Pentecost look like but he's got to pour it out on his people first. Amen. Everything in the New Testament starts with God dealing with his church. And then God deals with his church, and then God deals through his church. I don't know about you. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that. So if it's going to take me being real honest and let the Holy Spirit come in and do an inventory in my life, and shine the light in areas that need to be eliminated? I want to do that. Amen. I want to do that. I, I, don't, I know we live on a planet that's, that's sinful and it's still under the curse of sin, but it doesn't have to get on us. Amen. Could you turn to somebody, please, and say that to them? Say, it doesn't have to get on us. Number three. So first thing, first thing, their eyes were open and they were more, they became self-conscious rather than God-conscious. Number two, they tried to establish their own religion, fig leaves. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Number three. Now, let me just stop here for a minute. If, listen, if they tried to cover themselves when God showed up on the scene, that means they knew something was wrong. Because why, why would you go hide yourself? Why would you go, why would you try to cover yourself? 
They knew something was wrong. Amen. Number three, Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. Now, this is where the enemy has been very successful with shame. He lures us into doing something wrong, and then he turns on us and goes, oh, is that how a Christian's supposed to act? Oh, you're supposed to be Mr. Born Again or Mrs., you know, you're supposed to be Miss Holy Roller. You're supposed to be uh, the child of God. You're supposed to be full of the word, full of the spirit. Look at, how you, look at what you just did. So what happens? Shame comes on us. And that's what happened to them. Shame keeps us from being transparent before God. Therefore, we can't receive from God. I want you to hear that. Shame keeps us from being transparent before God. Therefore, we can't receive from God. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I've seen this. I've seen this in my own life in the past. I've seen it in other people's lives. When you're carrying shame, listen to me. I, I'm teaching tonight, like, I'm assuming you came here to learn something, right? Amen. Who, who came here to learn something tonight? Who, who came here to get better at this stuff? Okay. All right. But I'll pray for the rest of you. Because you're too preoccupied to even lift your hand up. Shame will cause you to be uncomfortable when the presence of God shows up. I'm going to say that again. because now, now start thinking about times when you've been in a church service, whether it's been here, whether it's in someplace else, and the Holy Spirit, the, the anointing shows up, and you start now. I know my early years in the church that I was in then, and the Holy Spirit would show up, I would go, um, maybe this is a good time for me to use the restroom. I remember one service that the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong. This is 38 years ago. The church I used to go to had two buildings. And one building was the education building, and then there was like this, court, this courtyard, and then the sanctuary was on the other side. So you remember when Joe Jordan came? So, okay. So, so this gentleman came. I didn't know anything back then. I was only saved maybe three, four months. And this minister came. I mean, this guy carried the power of the Holy Spirit. And here I am, brand new, never seen anything like this. And people are falling down. People are crying. People are laughing. People are plastered to the wall. I mean, the power of God. I got up and, and walked outside and stood in the courtyard and watched from the window. <laughs> watch this now. Watch this now. Okay. I didn't realize that I did not understand righteousness. I did not understand that I was accepted by God. I was still carrying the shame of my life before Christ. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. See, because if you don't renew your mind to the fact that God, Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, has made available to us the position of righteousness, but only God can put you in that position. But once you're in that position... It's like your past doesn't exist if you really understand that. But see, if you don't know that, the enemy will come and try to keep bringing your past up. Amen. And so when you keep entertaining what a bad, you don't understand, Pastor, I'm such a bad sinner. Yeah, yeah, get in line with the rest of us, okay? Some of us had master's degrees in sinning, okay? <laughs> but the old things have passed away. And behold... Come on, say it. Behold, all things have become new. But if you're not aware of that, and then you're put in a position where the presence, I'm talking about the tangible manifestation of the, I know we carry the presence of God in us. But there's a difference between the presence of God in us and then the presence of God that falls upon us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, if you're not, if you're not aware of the fact that you've been made righteous in Christ, when you come into the presence of God, you want to slink away. And it breaks my heart when the presence of God shows up like this in some of our services, and I see people almost afraid. And that's what sin did to Adam and Eve. We, we don't know, at least I don't, I don't know that I've researched it yet. Maybe you have. You can tell me. We don't know how long after Adam was created that the sin came into the world. I don't know. 
I have to go research it again, okay? So, so let's say it's a couple hundred years, 100 years, 50 years, 10 years, whatever that time was, Adam was completely absorbed with the presence of God. He had, didn't even know he had a body, let alone naked. And then all of a sudden, sin comes in, and his eyes went off of God and went on to himself. And you and I have been dealing with this junk ever since. We're self-conscious. We walk into a room, and we think, what are people thinking about me? What are people saying about me? I suffered from major, major panic attacks and anxiety attacks from the time that I could remember until the time I was about, well, I got saved at 27 years old, and let's say that kind of residue was there about a year after that. All those years. I've told you stories of my wife and I, when we were dating, before, way before I got born again, we'd go to a restaurant, sit down, order the food, and then that voice would start going, those people are looking at you. Those people are judging you. Those people, are, and I, I, my stomach would cramp. I'd get, I, it would feel like I hit, got in the back of the head. Would it, anybody ever have a panic attack? No, I, I don't want you to own it. Just, well, it would feel like somebody hit me in the back of the head with a two by four. And I can't tell you how many meals we left on the table. And I would say to her, I, I, I have to go. I can't stay here. That's what sin has done to us. And maybe you're not experiencing in that, to that degree in that area, but you may be experiencing it someplace else. Maybe you get easily intimidated. Maybe you're very much aware of what am I wearing? What am I driving? What do I live in? All of those things came as a result of sin. And that's why we see all this teaching about sin, not only in the Old Testament, but we see it more in the New Testament. Because God wants us to stay away from it. Because it can still affect us if we're not careful in our souls, in our, in our, our mindsets. In our, it can cause mental illness. He doesn't want us to suffer from these things. Amen? Yeah. Number four, I kind of just hinted at that. Fear and insecurity became part of the human experience. Verse 10 says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. I'll guarantee you, you may have heard me say this before if you've been in this church long enough. I will guarantee you, when we get to heaven, we're going to sit and talk with Adam, and he's going to say, I couldn't believe those words came out of my mouth because the thought never occurred to me about being afraid until sin came into the world. That wasn't part of the garden. That's why Paul, thousands of years later, writes, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Fear was never supposed to be part of human experience, yet most of us deal with some form of it every day. So if we'll distance ourselves from sin, if we'll walk in the light of the word, we can distance ourselves from these things and we can get free in our souls. We'll get free. Amen? Is this helping anybody today? Number five, this is the juicy one. This is real juicy. Verse 11. Verse 11. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Next verse. And the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So what's he doing here? Wait a second. Don't skip over this. No, he's not. No, he's not blaming the woman alone. He said the woman you gave me. Don't skip over that one. Because there's many of us in our lives, seriously, we go through things. We don't, we, there's some things that are hard for us to overcome. And we'll say, God, why isn't this area clearing up? God, why did you make me this way? God, why did you put me in this family? God, why did you put me on this job? God, we're doing the same thing Adam did. So what happens, okay? Previous to this, there was no such thing as, as blame shifting. All of a sudden, not only is he throwing his wife under the bus, I imagine what she must, could you imagine what she did when he said that? <laughs> but he's accusing God. 
He's probably saying, hey, I was good as a bachelor. You're the one who said it wasn't good for me to be alone. I didn't know what I was missing. We laugh about it, but think about it. Look, this is the beginning of mankind not wanting to take responsibility for our own sin. And so what did she do? And the Lord God, verse 13, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done, and what did the woman do? It's the snake's fault. No, it's your fault because you listened to the snake. You catching this? Now, this is a serious issue, okay? This serious issue. This is why why there's people that are trapped in addictions because they will not acknowledge their responsibility. Well, I'm, I'm this way because of my father. I'm this way because of my mother. I'm this way because of the neighborhood I grew up. I'm this way because of the color of my skin. I'm this way because of my ethnic background. I'm this way because of my economic status. I'm this way. Everybody's got an excuse. And it's because of sin. And we don't get free from these things until we acknowledge the fact it's my fault. It's my fault. I knew better, and I went ahead and did it anyway. Got it? Number six, the marriage relationship was affected by sin. Let's go to that verse. God said to her, your desire, from this point, your desire should be for your husband. And he shall rule over you. Now, now, I'm not saying that this is the way it's supposed to be. What I'm saying is God acknowledged up until this point, you guys had a good relationship. Until the point your husband threw you under the bus. To the point where you won't take responsibility for listening to the snake. So now the marriage relationship is affected. Sin comes in. Okay? You don't think that Adam, after he had time to think about it, said to himself, she hadn't come to me with this thing. Now, the fact is, if he, if he would have told her exactly what God had said to him, because remember, God gave the command to Adam not to eat before Eve was created. So whose responsibility was it to tell Adam? That's why God addresses Adam first. It was his responsibility. It's the responsibility of the head of the household. Amen? But look, at marriage has been affected now. Now, 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 of course, nobody in here does this, but you might know of a couple, that there's control, there's manipulation. The wife wants to rule over the husband, the husband wants to rule over the wife. Instead of there being harmony, there's a competition. Don't, don't move, don't gasp, don't raise your hand, don't. <laughs> but you see how sin has affected even this. You getting it? Number seven. Sin affected man's provision. Verse 17, that Adam, that to Adam God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So what is this saying? If he says, as a result of what you did, Adam, now thorns and thistles are coming up, that means thorns and thistles weren't there before this happened. Yes or no? Yes. That means you could go plant your tomato garden and you didn't have to worry about worms, didn't have to worry about weeds, didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. But now, he said, because you invited sin into the world, comes the curse upon the earth. You remember the garden was created to be a perfect place for them, Amen. perfect environment. The ground watered itself. It had some kind of an irrigation system. Mist would rise up. He didn't even have to water the ground. All he had to do was protect it and till it. And ground would produce. The ground would produce by itself. Now, we got to work for everything. Now, the blessing of God is on us if we're born again. If we stand on the promises of God, we can counter these things but we're still living on a planet that's cursed. Do you understand this? You and I need to make every effort that when the Holy Spirit shines a light on our lives and we recognize, man, this conduct does not fly anymore. This, I, can't, I can't go like this anymore. 
I can't think like this. I can't talk like this. I cannot conduct myself like this. Are you catching this? It's not because God wants us to, well, I want you to walk, uh, you know, uh, according to these rules and regulations. No, it's for our benefit. Because if we're not careful, due to the fact that sin is still in the world, even though we're born again, going to heaven, we can still get affected by these things. Do you know, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, do you know that even born again Christians have relationship problems? Did you know that born-again Christians can have marriage problems? Did you know that? Did you know that even born-again, going to heaven filled with the Holy Ghost people, can have poor self-image problems? Did you know that? Because we're still living on a planet that's affected by these things. Are you listening to me? These are all the tragic side effects of sin entering the human experience. Not to mention, I didn't even go to the spiritual death part which brought about physical death through sickness and disease. Do you understand that we were never supposed to die? It wasn't supposed to be part of our existence here on earth. It wasn't supposed to be part of our experience here on earth. We're supposed to live forever. Now, our spirits will, but we're supposed to live forever in the presence of God. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Hell was not created for mankind. It's the most foreign place for a human spirit to end up. But when a person rejects God, there's no place else in either the natural realm or the spiritual realm for a person who rejects God, rejects Christ, to go after they leave their body. It's not supposed to be our eternal home. None of this was supposed to be part of our human experience. Let me tell you what it's going to be like in the future. Well, let me go to, let me go to, to, to um, yeah, let me go to Romans chapter 5 first. Because God made a promise in verse 15 about the coming Messiah, the one that's going to come. He said to the serpent, you're going to bruise, he said about the Messiah, he would bruise the serpent's head And he said about the serpent, you're going to get a chance to bruise his heel, but the rescuer will come and he'll redeem us out of the under, from under this curse that has wrecked mankind. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that's Adam, right? And death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's disobedience, many will be made righteous. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he lived a sinless life, and yet took the punishment upon himself that you and I deserved, at that point, at that point, we're made righteous. What does it mean? We have received the ability to stand in the presence of God without any sense of guilt or condemnation. That is the way you and I are supposed to live. That was the way that God created Adam and Eve, living in that position. Now, Isaiah saw into his future and described how this redemption was going to take place. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And now because of Jesus' obedience, because of his willingness to sacrifice himself, we have peace with God. We are declared righteous. We have been justified. That means to be declared innocent. We are now children of God. We have been redeemed from the curse that comes from our own disobedience. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus purged our sins to purge means to totally clean out, to cleanse, to sanitize. That means the power of sin had to affect all these parts of our lives has been neutralized. So it's up to us to stay clear of sin at this point in time. And what's the final restoration look like? Revelation 21, verse 3. Revelation 21, verse 3. I heard a loud shout from the throne. This is John writing of his experience in the realm of the Spirit. He said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home 
is now among his people. He will live with them, and, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And I don't know about you, but I say hallelujah. At that point, all the effects of sin will be gone. Our bodies, our souls, our self-worth, our relationships will all be free from the poison of sin. And God wants us free while we're here on earth. He loves us so much that he sacrificed his own son, Jesus, on the altar of the cross so that sin could be broken off of us. And in communion, we're remembering the terrible price that Jesus had to pay to restore us back into relationship with our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. So, we're going to start to prepare our hearts for communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. I want, you to, I want you to pay attention to it. Read it with me. Not out loud. For I received from the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul writing. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Verse 28, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That's why we're taking communion tonight. We're not re-crucifying Jesus on the cross again. We are remembering the sacrifice that he made. <clears throat> I want us to sing a song to help us prepare our hearts. Can we do that, please? Thank you, Father. Jesus, we acknowledge tonight, Lord God, we acknowledge that if it was not for you, Lord, we'd still be in the depths of our sin. We'd still be on our way to hell. We'd still be completely unaware of your presence in our lives. Father, but because you sent Jesus to the cross, God, all of the effects of that sin, God, have been canceled in our lives. Thank you that you strengthen us, Father. Thank you that you empower us. Thank you that you teach us how to stay away from that stuff, how to eliminate it, how to neutralize it in our lives, God, so we can walk freer and freer and freer, God, completely conscious of who you are, walking in the position of righteousness, walking free from intimidation, self-centeredness, selfishness, with the ability to keep our eyes on you, God. Thank you. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place. Come on, give him some thanks. Give him some thanks. Give him some thanks. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for taking all of it upon yourself. Thank you for enabling us to get free, to stay free, and to bring that freedom to others, Lord God. We bless you tonight. Come on, lift one hand up to him. Just say this with me. Father, Father we bless you. We, bless we thank you. you. We are so appreciative, are so appreciative. Of, all of all that Jesus did on the cross. Amen. Amen. Now listen, before we take communion, if by chance there's someone here that's never, up until this point in, in your life, you've never made a declaration of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know about him. You understand about the gospel. You understand the inner workings of salvation, but you've never taken that step of declaring with your mouth your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that if we will confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart, that that's when we receive salvation. When we say the same thing that the Bible says, and if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you believe he died on the cross for our sins, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, there is nothing standing in your way from receiving salvation tonight, right now. Amen. So let's pray this prayer together. You know, there's, there's some of us in this room that are going to say this prayer tonight for the very first time. There are some here that are going to say this prayer as an act of recommitting or rededicating their life to the Lord. 
So we're going to do it all together with them. Amen? Amen. Say this with me. Father, Father I, believe I believe that Jesus is your son. Jesus is your son. I, believe I believe he died on the cross, died on the cross for, my for my sin. I believe, I believe that you raised him from the dead. He's alive, right He's alive right now. He hears me praying. Hears me praying. So, Jesus, so Jesus, I declare my faith in you. I, I believe in you. I, I trust you. I for my salvation. Thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for making me a child of God. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Now we're ready to take communion. Take that cup that was on your seat. Peel off that little film on top. Take hold of that little wafer there. What we hold in our hand is a physical representation of the bread of life, Jesus Christ himself, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of this world. We're blessed to be able to approach together this table of the Lord, this Eucharist, this bread of life. I'm going to pray a blessing over it, and then we're going to take it together as one big church family. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your blessing upon this bread, Lord God. Father, we recognize that it's without yeast, it's without leavening, representative and symbolic of Jesus, who was without sin, who gave himself willing, allowed his body to be pierced so that his blood could be shed, allowed his body to be brutalized, taking upon himself not only all of our sin, but also all of our sickness, all of our disease. And you declared through the prophet, and by his stripes, we are healed. So I thank you for your blessing upon this bread. We receive it with thanksgiving tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's peel off that foil off the top of that cup. We recognize that this is just grape juice in the natural, but it's symbolic of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us. The most powerful thing in every realm that exists, both the natural and the spiritual. This cup, this blood, is what defeated Satan. This blood is what cleansed you and I. This blood makes us worthy to come into his presence. Amen. Father, we thank you for your blessing upon this cup, Lord God. We recognize, we recognize that without the shedding of blood, according to your word, Father, there could be no remission of sin. Thank you, Lord, that you did not withhold the most powerful thing you have, the precious blood of your son. And so we receive this symbol of his blood. Our faith is in the blood. We recognize there's power in the blood. We recognize the cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we receive this with gratitude and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer before with us for the very first time, or you prayed it as an act of rededication, before we leave here tonight, would you please do us the honor of just coming up here. There'll be people that are standing in front of the platform. Would you tell them I prayed that prayer tonight for the first time, or I prayed it as an act of rededication? We want, we want to put some, some things in your hand. We have a Bible we want to give you. We have some other materials we want to give you to help strengthen you as you start now on this journey of your relationship with the Lord. If you prayed that prayer for rededication, we want, to, we want to be here for you. We want to help you. If you have any questions, we want to be able to answer them. If you need prayer for anything else, we want to be able to pray for you. So please, when everyone else is being dismissed, would you please come up for prayer? Now, there's one more thing. I know we've... We've gone a little bit longer tonight because it's, we had the baby dedications and all that. But I kind of made a promise to the Lord that whenever we gather together, that we would spend some time in prayer. 
I want us, as many as possible, if you could stay for 10, 15 minutes, I want us to pray. I want us, every single one of us, and whether you belong to our church or to another church or whatever it is, I want to see a wave of revival sweep across this area like never before. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening all over the place. It's happening across our nation. It's happening in other nations across the world. You might not be hearing about it. Switch off the news. Try to find some, some news organizations that are actually Christian that are reporting what's going on. There are massive miracles that are taking place. There are, there are people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in droves. It's happening. It's happening. There is an outpouring of the Spirit. And I don't know about you, I want to be a part of it. So, you're welcome. If you have to go, pick up your children. You need to do what you got to do. Please, there's no guilt. There's no condemnation. Nobody's going to judge you. If you need to be dismissed, go ahead and be dismissed. But those of you, if you would like to stay for just 10, 15 minutes, let's pray. Let's pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.